Number 10, false doors. Okay, right off the bat, imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb, all right? Imagine you've spent years of your life dedicating to this research, and then you find a door. You find an entrance carved into the wall, and this is it. What lies beyond? It's time. You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it's a fake door. It's a false door. Yeah, just a Looney Tunes door. Somebody juked you out 4,500 years ago. Gotcha. Their spirit's been waiting that long to be like, nice, idiot. All right, we can go. We're good. False doors in Egyptian tombs were quite common in ancient Egyptian times. But if we look elsewhere throughout history, we find false doors in ancient Rome, in both tombs and the interior of homes. So that ought to be confusing for any house guests back then. It's also important to note that Egyptian culture was influenced by Mesopotamian architecture. So we've had fake doors around for a while now. A lot of confusing people for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead, and that spirits were able to travel here and there throughout living and death. Most false doors can be found on the west wall because Egyptians believed the west to be the land of the dead. Number nine, the tomb of Uzer. Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released this photo. This six foot tall slab of pink granite was carved over 3,500 years ago, and this door was found near Karnak Temple in Luxor, and originally it belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hatshepsut back in the 15th century. Now, Uzer was a high ranking official and held the position of vizier for 20 years at that time, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Remember, Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead. That's gonna come in quite a few times in this video. The actual slab of granite, this door, was found far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later and ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Never thought I'd have to say this, but um, don't steal doors from the dead. Got it? Okay, let's move on. Number eight, Alexandria Black Tomb. What if we found a tomb and then just opened it, you know? What if we found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria, say back in 2018? Do you think it would be wise to just open it because we're curious? Spoiler alert, we opened it and it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. When archeologists found this massive tomb untouched for over thousands of years, on one hand, yeah, that's a feat in itself, but us humans, we're curious creatures. We just gotta, just a little peek just to see who's in there. I mean, after all, it could be Alexander the Great, right? That's the whole point of all this. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted only a few centimeters before every official involved at that construction site just fled the scene. They straight up just ran away. It smelled that bad. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this guy put his entire head in the tomb just to show us that it's safe. That's great. I mean, you could use your hand, maybe even a foot, I guess, just a little foot dip, but straight to the head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri, be smart about this. Number seven, Valley of the Kings. While March 2020 wasn't the best month of all time by any means, Egyptian officials did locate a secret vault hiding in the sands of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Just off the west bank of the Nile, the Valley of the Kings, as its name hints towards, is a pretty historical part of Egypt's past. Again, do we want to open this vault? Probably not, but did we? Yes. Bones and goo and history. What do you know? Surprise, surprise. Number six, 2020 tombs. Summer 2020, nice. While most of us was stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, they were occupied for the most part. Found, of course, in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archeologists have never been more excited. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind blowing. Grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days, and for all these to be untouched for this long is honestly unbelievable. These findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations. That's what makes this so insane. Like Persians and Greeks, they were all around at this time. The idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but again, do we need to open all of them up? Maybe there's treasure, maybe there's bodies. Either way, it's not yours. <laughs> Am I insane? Maybe I'm insane. Do we need to find Alexander the Great this badly that we're willing to disrespect this many souls in the process? Number five, get to work. Also speaking of movies, you know that classic scene where the prisoners are out on work duty, everyone's in their like orange jumpsuits, they're cleaning up all the garbage? Okay, that but ancient. A lot of criminals, thieves, and no good rotten folks were used for hard manual labor. Pretty classic. And you guessed it, building the pyramids. While the pyramids are often misconceived of being built by YouTube's least favorite S word, it was most likely built by a combination of people, mostly crafted skillsmen and builders, followed by crooks and those wishing to get out of the hot, hot sun. The job was dangerous, hot, like I said, and oftentimes heavy lifting, too much for me. While normal workers were granted two days off a year because it is backbreaking work, the criminals were tasked with quarrying stone with no days off. No machines, no 
iron tools. I mean, it's all, oh man, that must be awful. Just the horse. <laughs> just, just, just the horse. Number four, tarnish reputation. This one actually makes a lot of sense, really. Depending on how heinous the crime is, you wouldn't want this for stealing some bubble gum. So if you found yourself in hot trouble or the principal's office, which I was never in for being a bad boy, I was good every single time, I promise. No one believes me still, but I, I was. The vizier or government would keep track of who's been sneaking into tombs like Laura Croft. Hence, they could use this information to tarnish your reputation. It was also used against false witnesses and those wishing to gain something from a legal situation. Those that wish to bear false witness would immediately have something amputated because that's the law around here, partner. Number three, Fair Pharaoh. The great Pharaoh Bacchus is an interesting subject to say the least. First off, I had to say his name a couple times before I really understood what was going on there. I blame the dyslexia, but that's just how it goes, baby. But secondly, he's the guy that takes power and goes, whoa, 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 guys, maybe not so harsh. And I use this term lightly, but he improved human rights, specifically improvements for prisoners who owe debt. Hmm, sounds like someone might have owed someone a few bucks himself, hmm. Interestingly enough, his laws were influenced by Greek laws, who then influenced more Greek laws, who those Greek laws influenced Roman laws, who then influenced our modern law. There's a, there's a big chain of events there. Trust me, it all matches up. Number two, your nose knows. Knows to stay out of trouble. I say this one for the bottom of the list because, well, it's just so awful and weird. In a town called Rhinocolora, not too far from Cairo, but 200 miles, was a town full of people with no noses. What? I know. This wasn't a Red Skull Comic Con convention, but a penal colony of sorts, maybe the first. These people were or had been accused of thievery, and for this they had their noses removed to show anyone who visited what kind of people they really were. In a world of infection and disease, I cannot recommend this. It's not a good idea. You, you probably wouldn't make it after they removed it. The name Rhinocolora, which literally translates to Clip Nose, the town of Clip Nose. That's, that's not good. Number one, in God's hands. Remember before I mentioned the priests used to handle verdicts? Well, it's crazier than you might think, actually. While the Pharaoh was top dog in ancient Egypt, and I mean he was top dog, you don't, you don't get past the Pharaoh, the gods controlled everything and the Egyptians worshipped their gods. Crops, weather, justice, I mean they did everything. So oftentimes the priest verdicts would come down from the gods themselves. If that wasn't enough, the god Mahis was responsible for those criminals in the afterlife where they would also receive comeuppance. Uh oh, you're not safe anywhere. A sort of jail in the sky, if you will. Alcatraz has nothing on that. You're bad here, you're bad in the sky, you're bad everywhere, bad in the afterlife. So that's why folks, you behave yourselves. Keep your nose, behave yourself. All right, so the Cambiuses are up first. Cambius was the son of Cyrus the first and the succeeder of his father in Anshan as the king of Agistius of Media. According to the fifth century BC Greek historian Herodotus, Cambius married a daughter of Asidius by whom he became the father of Cyrus the second. Cambius the second, aka Cyrus the second, performed the ritual duties of the Babylonian Babylonian king at the important New Year festival of 538 and of 530. Before Cyrus set out on his last campaign, he was appointed the regent in Babylon. That campaign was the conquest of Egypt, planned by Cyrus, and was a major achievement of Cambius's reign once captured. This is the lunatic who liked to torture animals for entertainment and notoriously killed the Apis bull to torment the Greeks who worshipped it. Cambius was traveling through Syria on his way back to Persia when he first heard reports of a revolt there. And then he died mysteriously in Syria in the summer of 522, either by his own hand or as the result of an accident. This is one of the few Persian families to have held the throne, the Xerxes line. First we have the granddaddy Xerxes I, or the Great as titled by the fifth Persian king. He was the son of Darius the Great and his reign lasted from 486 BC to 465 BC. He's well known in history for his attempted invasion of Greece and how later in the same year he was defeated in the battle of Salamis, which led him to flee his own kingdom. He's known as both a Persian ruler and a pharaoh as when he ruled Egypt, it was also part of the Persian Empire. Little is known about the last years of Xerxes' life. After his reversal in Greece, he withdrew into himself and allowed himself to be drawn into his harem intrigues, in which he was, in fact, only a pawn. Thus, he disposed of his brother's entire family at the demand of the queen. He was assassinated by his own commander of the royal bodyguard forces. Another son, 
Artaxerxes I succeeded in retaining power. Artaxerxes I was given the throne by the commander of the guard, Artabanus, who had killed Xerxes. It's fine though, cause Xerxes Jr. got his daddy's lick back when he kills Arta about a month later. His reign, though generally peaceful, was disturbed by several insurrections, the first of which was the revolt of his brother. During his reign, Artaxerxes completed the Hall of 100 Columns at Persepolis, rebuilt the palace of Darius I at Susa after a fire, and Artaxerxes died of natural causes in 424 BCE, having ensured a peaceful succession by naming Xerxes II his legitimate heir. Xerxes II reigned for only a little over a month, however, before he was assassinated. Next is the Dossier line. Starting with Dossi Dajer from the Second Kingdom Egypt's Third Dynasty, he undertook the construction of the earliest important stone buildings in Egypt. His reign, which probably lasted 19 years, was marked by great technological innovation in the use of stone architecture. The innovative structure was a departure from the traditional use of mud bricks alongside stone. The greatest advance, however, was the completion of alteration of the shape of a monument from a flat topped rectangular structure known as a mastaba to a six stepped pyramid. This great character built the famous pyramid and set up the construction mechanisms of large buildings, paving the way for successors of their kingdom for even more daring constructions. The Pyramid of Dossier is the first pyramid in history of ancient Egypt and therefore potentially all of humanity. It is a degree pyramid that is at the center of a funerary complex of great importance. It's located in the necropolis of Saqqara. Sekhemet is probably the brother or eldest son of King Dossier. Little is known about this king since he ruled for only a few years, however he erected a step pyramid at Saqqara and left behind a well known rock inscription at the Wadi Makara. No pep in his servant steps for sure, it's Pepe. So Pepe the first kills the game. He does a great job ruling Egypt. He initiated the policy of, of intensive penetration of Nubia south of the first Nile cataract. Inscriptions record journeys southward early in his reign and fragments of vessels bearing the king's name were excavated in Karma. Meanwhile, Pepe the second is the longest running Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. He's also believed to be the youngest ruler ever in Egyptian history. Pepe the second was the son of Pepe the first obviously and was born late into his father's reign. While he was still very young, he succeeded his half brother Marine, who died at an early age. His mother served as regent for a number of years and the old group of officials serving the royal family maintained the kingdom's stability. During the first half of his rule, he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half? Nowhere close. You see a sharp decline of the old kingdom as economic disarray is caused by him virtually having no oversight. Powerful provincial nobles drew talent away from the capital, and because of the unusually long reign of the king, Egypt had a senile ruler when it needed vigorous leadership. Those of Pepe's children who survived him had brief ephemeral reigns and failed to cope with the political and economic crisis that arose as the sixth dynasty ended. His tomb may be more famous than he is, Menkures. His tomb, the pyramid of Menkure is one of three pyramids of Giza alongside his statue triads that show the king together with his wives and various deities. It's the smallest of the three main pyramids of Giza, just 62 meters tall, but has one of the most complex and best preserved structures. He had two wives, both are his sisters naturally, and they didn't have much luck with sons at first. Three in total and one daughter. At his death, his successor, his son, Shafeskek, completed the stonework walls of the mortuary temple in brick. Menach who was not succeeded by his eldest son, who actually predeceased him, but rather by Shepsake, a younger son. Shepsake built a monumental mastaba at the South Accra and was the only kingdom ruler to not build a pyramid. This family's work, especially the Great Pyramids, show a great mastery of monumental stone working. Individual blocks were larger, colossal, and were extremely accurately fitted. Number five, bug repellent. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I smell certain things, Reminds me of stuff. I'm like that rat in Ratatouille. It just, oh, I love fr France. It smells like France in here. I don't know. <laughs> Don't smell your own farts, Chief, I don't know. As summer is just about to begin for me, it's sunscreen, beer, and of course, bug repellent. I don't know exactly what's in the bug repellent, but I know it doesn't work very well, and I know it smells like it's shaving minutes off my life. Ooh, not good. Well, ancient Egyptians had their own version of bug repellent. When the pharaohs and royals wished to enjoy a picnic outside in the beautiful sun, oftentimes there would be bugs. So to prevent this, they found the next closest servant and slathered them in honey, lots of honey. 
Ooh, too much. And then place them a safe distance away from said picnic. Do this a few times and you got yourself a bona fide fly trap. Now you can enjoy your picnic in peace. You know, just ignore the servants screaming because they're being eaten alive by flies and all kinds of bugs. Ooh, kind of gross. Number four, mouse toothpaste. A lot of things I can understand. There's a point to it all. It adds up. Checks out. The mouse toothpaste does not check out or add up. I talked to the chief and he said that's not it. Yes, the ancient Egyptians knew that dental hygiene was very important, as it is. Go brush your teeth. They knew brushing their teeth was important, as well, yeah, as it is. And it should be noted that they may have invented the toothbrush. Hmm, pretty cool. However, it is in my humble opinion that they missed the mark on the toothpaste. There's no Colgate around. Basically, you take a cute little mouse and you crush it up until it's just a paste or essence of a mouse, as they call it. Then, to combat what I'm sure was a horrific scent, herbs and spices were added, oftentimes mint, for that minty fresh breath that everyone so needs. Disgusting. No thank you. I'll pass. Number three, mummies. Yes, we all know the ancient Egyptians had mummies. Pharaohs and kings wrapped up like a good Christmas gift in preparation for the afterlife. You may have heard some things about it, and I'm here to tell you all the awful stomach churning things you've heard. They're true. That's right. In particular, the removal of the brain. While the ancient Egyptians were incredibly smart and talented, the process for removing the brain had the same finesse your grandpa had trying to get ketchup out of a glass bottle. I'll get it eventually. Yep, it's coming. <laughs> I'll get it. A long iron stick was used to be inserted into the nose until it reached your brain, right past the fifth grade memories. The next step was to stir vigorously until you could lay the person on their stomach, and the brain came out in what was probably the most offensive pink slurry I've ever had the displeasure to think of. Disgusting. Disgusting? I can't believe you done that. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be sick. Number two, makeup. Surprise, surprise. The ancient Egyptians came up with another invention, makeup. The billion dollar industry that isn't going anywhere. You might be surprised to know that both men and women wore makeup back then. Although, today that's that's a case too. And a, a, as an actor, I've worn makeup a lot. It's really not that big of a deal, really. What is a big deal, however, is how they made it. If you've ever seen any images of Egyptians, then you know how blue and green eyeliner is a must have. Well, the main ingredient in that eyeliner isn't paint, folks. It's beetles and bugs. Gross. Colorful bugs were crushed up and added to make compounds in order to achieve the Egyptian look. Number one, shepherd of the anus. Like I said before, the Egyptians contributed greatly to art, medicine, engineering. They were smart. But for the last point today, we're going to focus on medicine and more specifically the doctors who were most likely the first proctologists. Way to go, Egypt. The Egyptian for these behind doctors literally traits to shepherd of the anus. They would administer medicine and, of course, the always famous and pleasurable enemas. They loved enemas in ancient Egypt. Who would have thought? They thought, they thought it was a gift from the gods. Crazy. Okay, so let's talk about horrible hygiene. Maybe an over-exaggeration, but hygiene of any kind was better than whatever the hell they were trying to accomplish in Europe without showering. At least the people of ancient Egypt considered it an important enough cultural value that they'd wash once a day. Even if it meant they also shaved their head, crunched down beetles for makeup, and rubbed dung on their acne. 2,000 years before Hesse Ray was credited for being the world's first dentist, the Egyptians were making their own toothbrush by French the ends of twigs. The toothpaste used was a powder like that vegan one at Lush that makes you feel like you're chewing on chalk. It was made of ox hooves, burnt eggshells, and pumice. Mmm, kiss me good morning after you rub that on your teeth with your dental twig, babe. Speaking of, for those whose breath smelled as bad as the armpits of the lower class Egyptians, also had numerous mouthwashes. Some had to be chewed up and spat out like bran or celery. Honey was combined with boiled herbs and spices such as cinnamon and myrrh to form a dehydrated pellet which they also used as breath mints. And speaking of armpit, the Egyptians had a deodorant body rub made of ostrich egg, turtle shell, and roasted tamarisk. Nothing like waking up bright and early for a day of building pyramids and the first thing you have to do is some casual Harry Potter potion making just to not smell like camel crap. Speaking of hygiene, your clothes were never clean. So even if your body was haha germaphobe, you still aren't safe. In the later periods of ancient Egyptian history, people began wearing clothes made of linen, not hides, cottons, 
furs and rendered leathers like they used to. Linen was light and flexible, so it was good for the hot Egyptian climate. However, linen was white, meaning the clothes showed dirt very easily, an issue they hadn't really had to deal with before. But most materials they'd worn didn't hold up well underwater like linen did, so the ancient Egyptians started doing laundry more often to get rid of the dirt. But they washed their clothes in the Nile, where people also relieved themselves, and dumped garbage, and human bodies. So uh, this meant that the Egyptians washed their clothes in water filled with parasites and bacteria. Even if drying it in the sun baked most of that away, you then still had the world's chafiest linen. To learn who did the laundry, the labor, the provision, and the caretaking, let's discuss family values. You may as well pop a little white picket fence up around the pyramids, guys, because nobody idealized the nuclear family quite like the ancient Egyptians, who held it at the core of their society. There was a tremendous pride in one's family, and lineage was traced through both the mother's and the father's lines. Everyone, even the gods and goddesses, were married. While premarital relations or any romps between unmarried people were socially acceptable, an unmarried man was seen as incomplete, and schoolboys were advised to wed early and father as many children as possible. Once married, however, couples were expected to be sensually faithful to each other. Egyptians, with exception to the king, were in theory monogamous, and many records indicate the couples expressed true affection for each other. Although the institution of marriage was taken seriously, if you don't end up working out with the person you married at 15, shocker, divorce was not uncommon, let alone remarrying, so at least that was one little less impossible thing. Until marriage, following their parents' footsteps, boys were trained in the trades and professions by their fathers and uncles, while girls stayed at home to learn from their mothers. In their early adult years, girls would marry, move from home, and the cycle would start again. Would start again with the dreaded childbirth. Egypt had the highest birth rate in the ancient world, and yet things were far from perfect. Although the Egyptians understood the general functions of parts of the reproductive system, the relationship between said parts were sometimes unclear to them. Like the origin of a man's love potion, since it was white, is from his bones, because those are also white, and nothing else was. Logic, eh? Most married women spent most of their lives either pregnant or breastfeeding. With little medical advice available, amulets and charms bearing figures of the pregnant hippopotamus goddess Tarawet and the mini demigoddess Bess were often used to protect both the mother and her unborn child, as children of all sexes were valued and desired. The mother prepared for birth by removing her clothing, loosening her hair, or just snatching her wig off. They did wear wigs. The birth of the child was a great joy, as well as a serious concern given the high mortality rate and stress of childbirth on a mother. So a midwife was an important career in Egypt. The everyday mothers squatted on birthing bricks for delivery, wealthy households had specially constructed huts or pools, and the midwife used a sharp obsidian or flint knife to cut the umbilical cord. The midwife was also on standby to try and help in any troubling birth situations that may arise. After childbirth, you breastfed for how long? Next one is latch off already. One of the best ways to maintain a healthy infant under the less than sanitary conditions that prevailed in ancient times was by breastfeeding. In addition to transfer of antibodies through mother's milk, breastfeeding also offered protection from foodborne diseases. If your kid isn't exposed to potentially contaminated food at the time when their immune system is at its weakest, they're inherently going to survive longer. Way of the jungle, y'all. It's why we don't feed babies chicken. Indirect evidence for this occurring in ancient Egypt actually came to us from a number of cemeteries where young adults and unders death rates peaked at times that correlated with the introduction to solid foods in their body. Prolonged lactation also offered a number of health advantages to you as the mother. Primarily, it reduces the chances of conceiving another child too soon by hormonally suppressing ovulation, which allows the mother more enjoyable stress-free times with her husband between pregnancies. So how long is prolonged? A minimum of a three-year period for suckling was recommended in the instructions of any from the new kingdom, and therefore struck an honestly unconscious but evolutionary important balance between the needs of procreation, the health of a mother, and the survival of a child. And speaking of, after that unification happened, it paved the way for the royal trendsetter Narmer. Because before our boy Narmer came along, the red crown of Lower Egypt and the white crown of Upper Egypt were worn by the pre-dynastic kings. Narmer was famously the first king to be portrayed wearing both crowns, symbolizing that union. This would later be replaced with the striped crown, a continuous representation of union called a nemesis. Adorning the top was the uraeus, an upright cobra that symbolized the ancient Egyptian goddess Wajet, meaning the pharaoh was ready to strike his enemies with deadly venom. Trendsetter Narmer doesn't stop at crowns, he's the first ruler to portray themselves in a royal beard, which every Egyptian pharaoh wore afterwards, whether man or woman. Then there's Narmer's implementation of an official who has the most important task of carrying the pharaoh's magic sandals. Egyptian pharaoh's sandals were the only piece of clothing that separated them from the land of Egypt and rightfully symbolized the union between the heavenly god world and the earthly human world. King Tut's sandals were famously inscribed with pictures
pictures of his enemies, meaning with every step he was crushing the enemies Egypt. In the famous Narmer palette, he's also seen wearing a fake bull tail which symbolized strength to rule the country of the Nile, but that trend didn't stick. Hey, so Ramses has 50 lost daughters. What a crappy dad, doesn't know where all his kids even are. Kinda understandable when you have 102 of them with about 9 women however. Made possible by somehow living to be 91 in an age where people died at like 20. Suffice to say he had lots of leisure time. Of course, not all the children were children at the same time. Ramses II began his family long before he took over as king and he reigned for 66 years. He spread the brood out over most of that time. So archaeologists announced in 1820 they uncovered a tomb built by Ramses and that 52 or so of his sons happened to be in it. They finally recently started excavations after a few decades and now we know that the mausoleum is the largest and most complex found to date in Egypt's Valley of the Kings with at least 62 rooms. But Egyptian kings normally didn't build mausoleums for their offsprings. Their principal wives, yes, over in the Valley of Queens, but their kids, no. If it turns out that only Ramesses' sons are in the tomb, where are the 50 daughters? Sexism can answer that. Males were regarded as potential heirs to the throne and the princesses were not, so they weren't held in high esteem and didn't get a fancy resting place. Doesn't mean they didn't have value, Ramesses designated at least three of his daughters as princess queens. Woo! No? No. Oh, no. What that suggests isn't pretty. But what isn't known is whether or not they were actually married to him and, you know, producing, or if the title was a way of honoring selected daughters from tertiary wives. Historians, however, are pretty confident on which one it is. This would be the end of the story, but for a single question. Why would a latex protection manufacturer name its product for a man who had 102 kids? Are you choosing cats or your empire? In Egypt, the penalty for killing a cat was death. This was wasn't just a law against cruelty to animals or sadistic Friday the 13th butchery. All you had to do was accidentally run over a cat with your chariot and you're done. This is mostly due to the animal being closely linked with the cat headed goddess of warfare and balls of twine, Bastet. They were also revered for the role they played in protecting food stores and homes from disease by killing pests like snakes and rats. Basically, pharaohs coined the three laws of robotics a millennia before Asimov and used them to protect the thing that poops under the stairs. And I, I don't think there are exceptions. One writer did Doris Siculus even recorded that the king of Egypt himself personally tried to intervene and save a Roman man who had accidentally killed a cat. His people did not give a single up, however, ignored the ruler, showed no mercy, caring literally negative a thousand if it meant risking war with Rome. They formed a mob, hung him, and left his body in the streets while the pharaoh sent a real awkward fruit basket apology to Rome. Perhaps the greatest example of a pharaoh placing the well-being of cats above that of his own people, however, was Pharaoh Pismatic III literally told his army not to fight the Persians' advancement because these smart little twists had painted the image of Bastet on their shields and marched behind a line of dogs, sheep, and cats. In their words, whatever animals the Egyptians hold dear. The Egyptians, under threat of death from the pharaoh, had no choice but to let the Persian ruler walk straight into the city unchecked. He then murked anyone who dared to challenge him, using the shields with cats drawn on them because you can't even strike an image of a cat in ancient Egypt. Cambyses, the ruler's name, celebrated in a dignified noble fashion, marching the Egyptian armies past him as he threw cats at them and screamed in salts at their gods. We aren't 100% sure who the first pharaoh was, but it was probably Catfish Chisel. The only way we know the lineage for early Egyptian kinship is the highly damaged Palermo Stone, which was a black slab of granite carved full of the names of kings up to the 5th dynasty. The part of the stone where the first and second king of the 1st dynasty is inscribed is bust to clean off. Although it is generally accepted that the first king was Narmer, aka Menes. The second one was Aha. Even without enough evidence to prove beyond a doubt I can't get past the Aha thing. The name of Narmer is composed to two ideograms, the catfish reading as Nar and the chisel reading as Mer. The location of Narmer's body has eluded archaeologists for two centuries now. The first Egyptian pharaohs used to build a type of tomb called a Mabasta and they did so until the third dynasty when they started busting out pyramids. It's theorized Narmer is in one of those. But then Egyptologists have discovered a large field of pre-dynastic and early dynastic royal tombs in Umakab and the Narmer's name is identified in an inscription found. However, this is Egypt. The site had suffered disturbances, tomb robbing, and distress for the past 5,000 years, making it impossible to know which one of the bodies is the precise tomb of Narmer. To this day, archaeologists and Egyptologists disagree on whether Narmer was buried at Saqqara or Umm el Khab, and in the end, his cause of death isn't even fully known. Just that of a philosopher in Mantheo saying the reign of Narmer ends when he was carried off by a hippopotamus and perished. And last but not least, 
believe my eyes, even though it may be a lie. Who knows, I don't, but I love a good rhyme. While it was likely a disease genetically inherited in his DNA, the official Egyptian story is that Pharaohs was cursed by the gods with blindness. Apparently, when the Nile was flooding, Pharaohs got fed up with it, and instead of letting the water do its thing and calm down, he chucked a spear at it. Because yes, throwing a spear at a river would probably change things. For his insolence and stupidity, the gods struck his ass blind. Pharaohs vibes this way the best he can for 10 years before he meets an oracle that either wanted to pull history's most hilariously mean prank or genuinely believed the gods had passed on this message. But the oracle tells Pharaohs all he's got to do is wash his eyes with the urine of a woman who's never slept with any other person than her husband her whole life. Okay, well, Pharaohs isn't asking questions, he's here for solutions. He finds his wife and says, babe, I wanna spice things up in the bedroom, I have an idea. And the two of them give it a try, only it doesn't work. So now he's still blind, and his wife has some explaining to do. Before she does that though, Pharaohs needs some more urine and he needed it now. So every woman in town is gathered up and given a pot, which he then sat there dumping its contents into his eyes, one after each other. No, I don't know if he waited for it to cool down. I do know it was probably the color of French's mustard though, seeing as Egyptians literally only drank warm beer. So imagine. But somehow Pharaohs finds the one who's not cheating on her husband or hadn't banged someone before getting married and one of these warm beer pee buckets works. And I wish I was kidding, but the official Egyptian records say yeah, magic pee did this. His sight is back and he asks for the hand of the magic pee wielding woman so they can marry on the spot. All the while her husband awkwardly watches the consequences of his wife not cheating on him unfold. Oh, and then Pharaohs burned his old wife to death. Or at least that's how the legend goes. I highly doubt that it really did restore his eyes and maybe he just ordered historians to write a good story to explain a weird habit. You know, fetish. We got a fetish here. Sammy <laughs> Number 10, punishment first. Innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, right? That's that's how it goes. How do you know I drank the milk? <laughs> There's no milk in my face. How do you know? There'd probably be milk on my face. Not so much in ancient Egypt. While there is some evidence of jails existing, it is clear that they much preferred an immediate and swift justice. By that, I mean flogging, mutilation, removing limbs, uh, that sort of thing. A lot of these punishments were overseen by a vizier. In today's terms, it's sort of like a governor or official who had the power to oversee things like punishment through. Or at least held the most power besides the pharaoh, which, hey, that's a lot of power. While it may be an effective system for keeping prisons empty, no one should lose fingers for sliding a couple double bubbles in their pocket. That's just my opinion. Number 9. Prisoners while the promise of losing a limb, the second you're caught taking a cookie from the cookie jar, boy I've been there, is a great deterrent, prison can also work sometimes. It should be noted that Egypt developed a system of law and order 4,000 years ago, which is, well, a long time ago and very impressive. For anyone taking the bar exam, that should be your answer under why take on law. Because the Egyptians did it first, why not? They did it, it's probably cool. So it makes sense that they did have some prisons. There's depictions of prisoners and drawings and figurines, surprisingly, oftentimes having their arms bound to their back like a good episode of Cops. And a leash around their neck with ropes and, uh, well, it just looks a little strange and weird. Given that most criminals were done on the spot, it's not hard to imagine that the Egyptians were cruel to their prisoners, and they were, it was not good. They should be canceled, that should be canceled, them. Number eight, court. Believe it or not, they also had some sort of makeshift court as well, who would have thought? No hammer and gavel, and certainly no Saul Goodman or Judge Judy, but hey, without those, I'd argue what the heck's the point of the American justice system in the first place, right? Ah oh boy. But they were simple processes, to say the least. During the Middle Kingdom period, judges were appointed to decide on verdicts before well, it was usually priests, so I, I, I prefer a judge doing that, honestly. Except in this court, no one is legally represented by anyone. Yeah, that's right. There's no lawyers, but there was a jury and there were witnesses. Unfortunately, they were often beaten until, well, they said the truth, or uh, the desired truth. Number seven, police. Bad boys, bad boys. What are you gonna do? Yes, that's right. Ancient Egypt may have had the first police force in history. Who would have thought? I actually didn't know that. I mean, sure, the vizier is great and all, but he can't possibly go around arresting everyone. He'd be at this all day. He can't do that. So it's only natural that you hire a bunch of dudes to do it for you. Can't get them all, but you can get some of them. While they did provide some limited support to communities and crime in towns, most of their arrests were made against those who were a little too greedy and thought grave robbing, well, the many sacred tombs around would make for an easy payday. 
it didn't. Number six, Bloodhounds and Baboons. That's a weird title. This one is so weird, but okay, here we go. We've all seen the movies where there's a crook, a perp, or someone who's trying to outrun the law. Andy Dufresne was right. You gotta crawl through a lot if you want your freedom. I remember Andy Dufresne. Anyway, well, in these scenes, there was a good chance that law enforcement has dogs with them. Oh, yeah, see, I'm getting somewhere with this. There's also a good chance that those dogs were bloodhounds. Cute dogs, actually, but the reason they bring them along is because they have a great nose. They can sniff a scent and follow it for miles, oftentimes leading to the crook. Smart dogs. What if I told you though that this sort of thing existed in ancient Egypt, except that it wasn't dogs, it was baboons. Yeah, who would have thought? Yes, that's right, there's depictions of police with baboons assisting in the work with crooks and or criminals. It's all jokes until Diddy Kong shows up to arrest you. Now it's DK time, baby, uh-oh. Number five, breaks. Yeah, I've never broken anything and I don't plan to. It sounds like the worst thing. I see it on Reddit and I'm like, ooh. But living in ancient Egypt, you're gonna break a bone or dislocate something sometime. But back then, it's not like you can just head over to the emergency and get an x-ray or a cast and then get your buddies, a couple of pharaohs to sign it and get some crutches and be on your way. No, so how did they treat broken bones or dislocations back then? Well, we can look at one example from that Edwin Smith papyrus that I mentioned earlier, where there was a patient with two dislocated clavicles. Now the treatment here is described as follows. If thou examinest a man having a dislocation in his two collarbones, thou shalt find his two shoulders turned over and the heads of his two collarbones turned towards his face. Imagine reading this and you're like, okay, uh, I think we turn this this way? No, this way, hang on. Thou shouldn't cause them to fall back so that they rest in their places. Thou shalt bind it with stiff rolls of linen and thou shalt treat it afterwards with grease and honey every day. Yeah, if you break something, don't put grease and honey on, go to the doctors. Hit that thumbs up, there we go. The more we know. Number four, dental surgery. Okay, so back in the ancient Egyptian world, it's not like you can go to the dentist, get your teeth checked and cleaned, whatever, once a year, however you do it, I don't know. And the diet of the ancient Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, the cleanest. If I can say that, you wouldn't have a set of pearly whites every single day, that's for sure. And that's due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, well, in your mouth, is not gonna feel too good. That would cause tooth loss or troubles at an early age. Through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time, and they're a little interesting, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, and yeah. Buckle up. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found from the fourth dynasty. Now this mummy and his first molar, a bunch of surgically produced holes were there that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were performed back then in some way, shape, or form. I mean, in the form of a bunch of holes, and it's disgusting, but they tried. And do remember, as you're watching this entire video, all this was done without any anesthetic. So drilling holes, breaking bones, putting linen into your arms, you're gonna feel all of it. Number three, Anubis. Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of mummification. Yeah, he, uh, he had an interesting hobby, this one. Anubis, historically, he oversaw the embalming process during mummification. A lot of steps involved in mummification, so the backup here, you know, the backseat driving, that is Anubis, I'm sure was appreciated. Ancient Egyptians were so sophisticated in the mummification process that they also had to get really good at another major, well, kind of creepy, surgery, and that is the postmortem dissection. That matters, that's a pretty important step. See, in order to mummify the body, they needed to remove any moisture from it. Now this process included the removal of brain tissue, which was done through a quite a gruesome hook tool and some steady hands, that's for sure. This was not a medical practice, however, it was more of a spiritual one, right? It wasn't done by doctors, and this is exactly why they were getting extra up close and personal with internal organs during this process. The medical information they gathered during this process was never used for medical or medical advancement, but rather for spiritual, like Anubis, this ancient wonder. He kept trophies from those that he embalmed. Like, you know, different parts from people, that kind of thing. Word spread, you know, hey, Anubis likes body parts, pass it on, this guy's weird. So in turn, for centuries now, Egyptians would then offer pieces of lifeless bodies to Anubis. They're like, you know what, hey, heard you like toes, big guy. Here you go, enjoy, put that in your jar. You love it. Whoever gave him the jackal head, great call. That was a great call, he loves that one, big fan. Number two, dirty trick. The god Osiris ruled over ancient Egypt, but it wasn't an easy path, okay? Just like ancient Rome, there's always a jealous brother or jealous someone 
someone watching from the bushes, okay? Osiris' brother, Set, he was a jealous one. So he tried to take out Osiris at every single turn. Now, what elaborate plot was so crazy that it actually worked? This was like a saw trap set up. This is insane. So first, Set designed a coffin that fit Osiris' measurements, like to a T. So at a party, casually one day, Set challenged Osiris to hop into said coffin, saying, challenging, that if he can fit inside of it, the coffin is his. Yeah, like a gift. So for some reason, Osiris accepted the challenge, he jumped in, and as soon as Osiris got into the coffin, bam, Set locked him inside and threw the coffin in the Nile River. So in turn, Set then took over control of Egypt. Yeah, gotcha, got the last one there. So if any of your coworkers want to show you a coffin in the break room, respectfully decline the offer. It's, uh, it's probably a trap. And finally, number one, scarab worship. Yeah, we're getting stinky for the last one. Ancient Egyptians, they worshipped scarabs. They worshipped dung beetles. Now, when we think about animals in relation to ancient Egyptians, we go to cats first. But really, it was dung beetles the whole time. They're OG, those little stinkers. Egyptians could not keep their hands or their minds off of dung beetles. The Egyptians would observe scarabs rolling these balls of dung, and they would roll them along the ground until suddenly each beetle would disappear just like that into a hole in the sand. Now, ancient Egyptians compared these patterns to that of the sun which of course would go over and then leave at the end of the day. Just the ball rolling and then disappears. I can see the connections. Now the god Kefri was depicted as a man with a massive scarab as a head. So he was responsible for rolling the sun across the sky every single day. And no, the sun wasn't a big ball of poop. It was just a big ball of life. Number 10, the time warp. Okay, here's a very trippy fact for you. We all know ancient Rome, right? The lovable empire that took over a large portion of the world at its peak. Trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. Caesar, Augustus, the Colosseum. Yeah, those guys, we all know how long ago that was, right? 2,000 years or more. They were pretty cool dudes. Today, they are remembered for being a very successful empire and their triumphs. Well, what if I told you that the Romans are to us what the ancient Egyptians were to the Romans. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And they were still alive to tell the story. Well, at least some of them and some of it. Yes, that's right. When Rome was taking over, it was understood that Egypt was a land of great antiquity and there was much to learn. However, most of what we know of Egypt comes from Egyptian tombs, pyramids, and Egyptology from the early 20th century. Still pretty cool though. Number nine, board games. Call me crazy, but I love board games. My two favorite are arguably the most depressing. One being an actual fictionalized version of life and seeing who can rack up the biggest mortgages after having six kids as a police officer with a chef's salary. Ooh, fun. And the other is a recreation of the real estate moguls that charged exuberant amounts of rent during the Great Depression in the 30s. Wow, fun. Thanks, Parker Brothers. This may be because I have ancestors in ancient Egypt. I, I probably don't, but uh, we're just gonna roll with that joke anyway. I make bad jokes like that because ancient Egyptians loved board games. That, that was my connection. Yeah, I know, right? Games like 20 Squares, Hounds and Jackals, which is pretty much just snakes and ladders, and the most popular, Semet, which tasks players with moving their pieces on squares and eventually off the board. Kind of like Sorry, which is also one of my favorite games. I love Sorry. I think that we had a Canadian version called Getting Into Trouble. You know, the thing in the middle and you bop it. Remember that thing, the dice? Remember that? And you say, what are you guys doing? Getting into trouble, mom! So lame. So lame, dude. Number eight, labor strike. To say that it took a lot of manpower to build the pyramids, or really anything the ancient Egyptians ever built, is a little bit of an understatement. A lot of work went into it. Not only are the builds massive in scale, but also extremely complex and detailed, fooling some engineers today. They don't know how exactly they did it. Can you imagine building or moving all of those massive stones in the African heat and sun? I would need so much water. Just like today, it's really hot today. Well, as it turns out, this wasn't always the greatest job on planet Earth. Oh, surprise! And in one incident in the 12th century BC, the workers under Ramses III organized what may have been the very first labor strike. The workers had not received their grain rations and thus hid away in the monasteries until their woes were heard. It worked, and they were given their rations. Oh, so cool, the first labor strike, that's so weird. They modern stuff too, wow. Number seven, time warp again. Okay, here's one that's just kind of a head scratcher, but very true. And it has to do with the age of the Great Pyramids. The truth is, those bad boys are old, really old, older than your grandpa. And for a lot of ancient Egypt's history, they were there, regardless if the citizens actually knew anything about them. Constructed around 2560 BC, 
a long time ago. Cleopatra, the most famous of all pharaohs, and the chicest of all celebrities in the 60s. I mean, come on, it's Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, she's a good looking gal. Despite what modern depictions of ancient Egypt will have you believe, Cleopatra actually lived closer to the moon landing than she did the construction of the pyramids. Which is really hard to think about. She was closer to JFK, the pyramids, Vietnam, and not the pyramid. That's wow. That's a that's a it's kind of hard for my brain to wrap my head around that. Number six, bowling. The next time you find yourself in a bowling alley and find yourself a little queasy, and you're not sure if it's the smell coming from your bowling shoes or the radioactive microwave nacho cheese you just ate at the snack counter, you can thank the Egyptians. No, not because they made sure to play weird animations on the outdated TVs hanging from the ceiling that were outdated the second you walked in there as a kid. They're old then. Or the carpet that screams 1980s and please wash me. But because they invented the game itself, usually done with stone pins and a stone ball. It was quite popular amongst the crowns back then. Very cool. Obviously they didn't have the animations, but I think that makes it. You know, remember those, you know those weird like bowling animations you know what I'm talking about? Number five, can't take it with you. In life, you live and then you pass on. If you believe in the home sense signs your mom hangs up in a kitchen, then there's gonna be a lot of living, laughing, and loving with that. Ancient Egyptians believed in taking things with them to the afterlife. Yeah, pretty much everything was coming with them. Gold, treasure, organs, except the brain, and pretty much just anything you would need for that kind of adventure. Well, animals were no different. Oftentimes when discovering tombs of kings in the main chamber, or sometimes in their own, were statues of cats and dogs, and naturally, mummified kitties and doggies. Now, I love my pets just as much as the next guy, but uh, a discovery in 2019 revealed a tomb with statues, mummies, and even some preserved crocodiles. Ooh, weird, that's a weird pet. Number four, Tomb KV5. Sometimes you pass things off without giving them the proper time and attention. Like the fact that your middle toe on one of your feet is a little longer than the same one on the other side, and you're like, ah, Ah, it's probably fine, but it's actually a mutation that all of your ancestors had and it's the reason you can walk faster than everyone else. Not that that's happened to me or anything, but the archaeologists of Tomb KV-5 know what I'm talking about, sort of. Basically, KV-5 was not studied very well, and in 1995, it turns out that it was actually one of the largest tombs ever created in the Valley of the Kings. So far, we have found around 121 chambers and corridors, and we think there will be 150 total. The tomb was used for the sons of Ramses II, who, as we know, had over 100 kids. So, the size of the tomb kind of checks out. So far, we've only confirmed six, but there are likely to be around 20 of his sons down there. Number three, the Pyramids of Giza. A lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? Okay, obviously people can see these bad boys from miles away. It would be kind of hard to lose something like that, as Adam said. But then again, as a man, I take pride in losing my car keys every time I need to use them. But more specifically, it was the discovery of the inner chambers of the pyramids that really kicked off archaeology. The verdict? Well, these pyramids not only hold riches and riches of historical knowledge, but the engineering involved is out of this world, which, you know, is kind of how some people think they were constructed today. The complexity and craftsmanship the complexity and craftsmanship still has people scratching their heads. As for me, I believe that with enough careful planning and engineering, mixed in with a whole heap of uh, forced labor, you can just get about anything done. There's still much to be learned about these giants in the desert. Ooh. Number two, Aten. Even today, we are still making huge discoveries in Egypt. I mean, maybe not specifically today, April 27th, or whenever you watch this, but in this day and age. In 2020, we discovered a 3,000 year old city buried in the sand, and it's probably the biggest discovery since our number one spot. The city named Aten, or the Rise of Aten, is the largest city of its kind that we have found and gives us a really good look at life during Egypt's most profitable era. That would be the rule of Amon. That would be the rule of Amonhotep III. Amonhotep IV is his son, who would drastically change the country's direction. Following his father's death, the fourth changed his name to Akhenaten, abandoned the old Egyptian gods besides the sun god Aten, and moved the royal seat from Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, which is known as Amarna. 
He was a weird one, but this city wasn't weird. It was impressive. With an administration area as well as residential districts, production area where mud bricks, amulets, and other goods for buildings and temples were made, along with a bakery. Yeah, I love my croissants covered in sand too. Number one, King Tut, the man, the myth, the legend. Besides the pyramids, the sand, and the hot sun, nothing is more famous out of Egypt than King Tut. Well, why is this? Is he not just another royal bro who's just big chillin' in his tomb? Eh, yeah, sort of, but his tomb is very unique actually. Unfortunately for Egyptians and archaeologists alike, a lot of the tombs have been cleaned out by grave robbers and crooks, some of which are just long gone. The stuff could have been heisted at any point really, we're just not sure. King Tut's tomb however was pretty well untouched, and because of this, we got the chance to learn about a king who really didn't do too much. I think the sarcophagus stands out the most, the, the gold and the blue, it's beautiful. I love it. It's good aesthetic. We're gonna start with peace treaties. Egyptologists know Ramses II as the pharaoh who restored Egypt's relations with Syria and built a lot of neat temples in the desert back in the 1200s BC. And he's the one in that Disney movie whose first son gets smoked by the plague. Kind of a wild guy, so we'll talk about him quite a bit in this vid. Anyways, for over two centuries, the Egyptians fought against the Hittite Empire for control of lands in modern day Syria. The conflict gave rise to a bloody boot down, such as the 1247 BC Battle of Kadesh, but by the time of the pharaoh Ramesses II, neither side had emerged as a clear victor, and this was just becoming all drawn out and bloody and just plain stupid, especially with both empires facing threats from people outside each other. But who's ever going to be the first to wave the white flag, let's be real, when it comes to two dudes, y'all are notoriously known for just beating each other up, shaking hands, and best friends again. So in 1259 BC, the two said ah to hell with it, let's do lunch, and Ramesses II and the Hittite king Hatsusili III negotiated a famous peace treaty, one that was either the first known in creation, or one of the earliest ever. This agreement ended the conflict and decreed the two kingdoms would aid each other in the event of an evasion by a third party. This treaty is now recognized as one of the earliest surviving peace accords, and a copy can be seen above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council. How about some ancient Egyptian body dysmorphia, because bodies are supposed to look like this, right? That's what Akhenaten was probably wondering, and it must have been awkward as hell for fine as silk queen Nefertiti and normal looking son King Tut to try and lie their way through any reply to that because this whack job was known for two things. Firstly, as who forced monotheism on Egypt so brutally that when he died his son had to awkwardly erase his legacy and secondly he was one funny looking dude. He had an hourglass figure like a BBL baddie, an elongated head with a square jaw jutting out, big curved almond eyes and let's say he could have filled out a bra better than me. So Egyptians like to play photoshop with their selfies the way we do now and the first depictions of Ak, his body and head are normal. But after he forced monotheism that literally destroyed the economy and empire, his gender in sculptures and carvings became more ambiguous. Three explanations. First, he's the most hated pharaoh in history. So I mean, come on, artistic license, get some anger out. Second, perhaps his changing appearance was metaphorical, meant to portray Oct as the father and mother of all humankind. Third, is that it was a genetic disorder, such as amitrace excess syndrome, where the body released equal levels of both hormones. But we all know what the likely one was, seeing as these guys could quite literally not keep their hands, or really any appendage, out of their family members. I'm not gonna lie, I can't handle having eyeliner on for three hours that me and my roommate go out. Meanwhile, the pharaohs had obligatory face beat like they were working at ancient Sephora every day. Early Greek traders who visited Egypt were astonished by the sophistication and precision with which Egyptians took care of their skin and hair and decorated their bodies. Europeans remarked that almost everyone was wearing makeup even in public places and that'd be accurate as both men and women were known to wear copious amounts of the stuff believing it gave them the protection of the gods Horus and Ra who were always fighting or banging each other and doing so in a full face of makeup like some spectacular fursuit wearing drag queens. The only distinguishing factor between men and women's makeup was that men's makeup was simple while women's was often heavier and more complex. The distinguishing factor of all makeup, however, was wealth. Nobles could afford the fresher or less diluted products, while lower status had to use makeup from poorer quality materials, which sucks since they worked in the sun all day, and higher quality coal you lined your eyes with, the better it reduced sun reflection. This act will also protect them from evil spirits and eye diseases, as they believed their makeup had magical hearing powers, and they weren't entirely wrong. Research has shown that lead-based cosmetics warm 
traveling along the Nile actually staved off eye infections. All right, you annoying ancient astronaut people, this is for you, Tut's space knife. I am not sitting here doing the work for y'all pretending we all don't know who King Tut is. He was the child pharaoh, smoked by a hippo bite, cursed tomb, blah 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 blah. So we're just going to get right to it and say he had a knife literally from space. Specifically, a small dagger, but whatever effing y'all, this thing is so sharp. To this day, the TSA would tackle you sooner than let you board anything with it. They found it in Tut's tomb in 1920s with all that other magical treasury hunky dory that they stole out of there, and it was originally believed to be forged from the iron heart of a meteorite. Originally, ah, keyword, see, Egyptians didn't have the ability to smelt. They weren't actually suitably advanced in that realm. So they especially wouldn't be able to forge a weapon from space metal, let alone crack open a meteorite to get to it, or know that was even an option. This has led historians to presume that the dagger was a gift from a foreign nation that did possess smelty technology. While historians are pretty confident the foreign nation wasn't the Martians, they haven't explicitly ruled that out either, so I guess those ancient alien guys might have a point. If you like stuff like this, check out our top 10 alien hieroglyphs found in ancient history video. The story of how two pharaohs throw down over pet hippos. So, Pharaoh Sekinenri Teo, I'm gonna call him Sek, the second, kept a pool full of pet hippopotamuses, letting his massive pets splash and play all day. Obviously, you don't get close because these are blind rage death animal machines, but this guy loved his hippos so much he could kill for them. He was willing to die for them. In fact, he literally did just that. This is back when Egypt was divided, and the most powerful Egyptian kingdom was called Hykos, which was ruled by Pharaoh Apopi. Being a lesser king, Sek was required to pay tributes to Apopi out of respect. He could handle the humiliation of living under the tyranny of another man, RIP fragile male ego, but as long as a poppy didn't rub it in or act like an ass about it. So that's exactly what a poppy did. He went right for the sore spot by telling Sek to get rid of his hippos. Apparently they were too loud and a poppy couldn't sleep at night in his own house that was 750 kilometers away. Yeah, no. Sek says, hey, I can handle you bullying me constantly, but leave the hippos out of this. And he would not tolerate any further insults to his hippos. This, he declared, was grounds for war. That's what they did. Sek even died in combat, fighting for his right to a hippo pool. The war didn't end and when he died, however, his son kept it going. Two generations of kings fought for a hippo pool, and in time, they won. By the end of the war, Egypt had unified once more. All because of one man's love for his hippos. Sorostis, the genital king, is number five. Why genital king? Well, aside from being one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, he commemorated his success in a unique way, by setting up a big pillar with a picture of someone's genitals on it. Male or female, he wasn't picky. He sent warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretched his kingdom further than anyone else ever had, leaving these pillars on sites of every battleground. Aside from genital the pillars were of course ingrained with how he had subdued his enemies and how certain he was that the gods were in favor of his invade everyone policy. Quite cocky of him. The genitals depicted were based off of how valiantly their opponents had fought their invasion. Male depiction indicated that they were strong and brave soldiers, but the female depiction, well, it meant the word that we are all thinking. These pillars were left all across the continent and they stood the test of time. 1500 years later, after being erected, they still stand in series. Syria, engraved with the genitals of failure. Look up the word spoil and you'll see number four is Pepe II. He was the longest ruling Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. The first half of this rule he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half, nowhere close. In fact, it's the mark of the sharp decline of the old kingdom of Egypt as economic disarray was due to him virtually having no oversight. Pepe was made pharaoh in his early teen years, so naturally he got the spoiled brat treatment from mommy. A great example is shortly after being crown, an explorer sent to trade and collect ivory, ebony, and other precious items had written him a letter reporting that he had met a dancing pygmy. Why? This is the greatest thing Pepe had ever heard! He had to see it for himself. So he demanded its transport back immediately and to abandon all precious materials they'd gathered in return for a high reward. Well, he got his dancing pygmy and he got pretty much everything he's ever asked for. He learned to accept that he was more important than other people. By the time he'd grown up, he was so corrupt that he made his serfs strip naked cover themselves in honey and follow him around just to keep the flies away. Number three is the klepto gaslighting Amasis. He's remembered as a total prick. Amasis actually made his way onto the throne after the current pharaoh had sent him to calm down a rebellion, but when he got there he realized the rebels had a pretty good chance of winning, so he decided to lead them instead. Amasis decided the best way to tell the king about his change of sides and a declaration of war was by lifting his leg, farting, and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He was a rampant alcoholic as well as a klepto 
maniac. Apparently he would steal his friends' stuff, put it in his own temples, and then try to convince them that they had never owned it in the first place. However, amongst all his bratty behavior, Amasis brought some major reform to oracles. One example actually comes from when he was a poor thief on the street. When he had been caught stealing, he'd been sent to stand in front of oracles who were supposedly be able to divine tell whether he was innocent or guilty. Well, once he was king, he remembered which oracles had pronounced him innocent of the crimes he had committed, had them punished for fraud. Because if they'd actually been able to speak to the gods, they would have known he was always guilty. Number two is cutting down on crime, Actus Sains. Amasis wasn't tolerated for long and he was overthrown the way he'd done to his predecessor. This time, the rebellion was led by the Ethiopian Actus Sains, who believed in a gentler approach to kinghood. Actus Sains fought for the crown literally because of a magic spell he'd heard about and also to deal with Egypt's criminals in a flashy new way, controlled exile. Every person who committed a crime he ruled would have their nose cut off, and then they'd be sent off to the town he called Rhinoclora, literally the town of cut off noses. It was exclusively populated by these now noseless criminals struggling to survive in the harsh landscape, drinking dirty water and eating trash or the odd stray quail that came through. Something like this may have seemed harsh, but it was actually considered benevolence at the time. Roman chronologers of Rhinocola, or Rhinocolora, whichever it's pronounced, wrote an example of how Actus Sains was actually considering a kindly manner towards his subjects. So keep that in mind when you're doing a comparison of now versus then. And in at number one is Akhenaten. This pharaoh was so hated that the Egyptians themselves wiped his name out of history. Born Amenhotep, he changed his name to a Ahak, I'm gonna call him Ak, in accordance with this radical monotheistic drive. His new name meant that he is of service to the Aten, in honor of what he believed to be the one true god, Aten, the sun god. Acted everything in the name of the sun god. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Amarnia, and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean Horizon of Aten. And then he ordered a new capital city be built there. He chose the site because it was uninhabited. It was not the property of anyone else except Aten. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into this developing city and forced them to build it. These people had to push through everything. Based on the bones found in the town's cemetery, more than two thirds of his workers broke a bone while they are working and a good one third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished. When he enforced monotheism, Ak failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the national, socionomic, and cultural hubs. It was the gods' priests that oversaw the industries of agriculture and craftsmanship through their patronage and they who served as pillars of their communities. So by stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest recession and an entire empire nearly collapsed because of him. So it's no wonder after his death, Egypt immediately went back to polytheism and they also abandoned the new city he'd made them build. They destroyed his statues, his effigies, his monuments, and they removed him from their list of kings and history books. In fact, they did this so efficiently that we didn't really even know about him until his remains were found all alone in the city he had forced his subjects to create. Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't. But it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice, I made a rhyme, and one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number 9. Ancient Sunscreen As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night, and feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated. But also, you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so 
it wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. Not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs, meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What, I don't, what happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad, but ancient Egyptians, Eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts, and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day. Just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants or like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. Number six, get this man a Tic Tac or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kind of good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds, and cashews put together, ground up, and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool, and boom, breath mints. I like it. I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists, or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. Breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Number five, Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time to go, but in 2014, archaeologists discovered a 4,000-year-old tomb from the 11th dynasty, tucked away in Luxor, Egypt, of course, as this list says. Spanish archaeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty, and it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high-ranking official, because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt, and officials also believe this tomb could have been used as a mass grave. The important thing to note here is that the tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty, because tools and utensils from that later time Time were also found in this grave. We're gonna find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools, interesting. Number four, 210 sarcophagi. So we thought it was a pretty big deal when 160 bodies were recently discovered in Egypt. This was back in September 2020. Over 160 coffins were found. Wild, right? Well, those are rookie numbers, turns out. For this one, archaeologists found 210 sarcophagi near Queen Nefertiti's funerary temple in the City of the Dead, Saqqara. Yeah, there were over 160, surprise. Maybe next time you check in with us, that number will be even higher. Who knows? Hopefully, slash maybe hopefully not. I don't know how I feel about this. This was January 2021. We probably would have seen it on the news, but that was when 768 people were storming the capital, so the news was a bit busy, I guess. Thanks. These sealed coffins were untouched for thousands of years. They went from finding 160 to finding 210. That's incredible. According to the ministry, the sarcophagi were completely closed and haven't been opened since they were buried at all. They opened a few though, of course, just to analyze and display them, but that's it. Yeah, leave the rest. I'm not focused on ancient curses or Brennan Fraser having to come out and save the day. Just let dead people lay where they are. Let them rest. The amount of effort gone into hiding and preserving their memory alone. I mean, look how long it's taken for us to even find these things. It's almost like they didn't want to be found. Number three, the ancient curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods, which is a lot. One of them warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. 
Also, if I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers next will be wrung out like a goose, I would turn back. I wouldn't want to investigate further. I would just walk away. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across, you know what I mean? But inside the found tomb of the vizier Enkimor, a pharaoh's official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Buried in a mastaba, an above ground massive tomb, was this warning. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing a ghost. Yeah, there's that, or beware of dog. I don't know, you can pick which is more impactful on your property, sure. Number two, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. You're getting good, nice. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. I mean, for starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, huh? KV-52 was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and this one, KV-52, they all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these vaults were found, so when we enter this tomb, specifically KV-52, that's been untouched, ideally, for thousands of years, we can look forward to finding anything. In fact, whatever we do find, it's a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was completely empty, well, that doesn't feel too nice. Something here is wrong. It was empty except for two boxes. Both were black and undecorated, which is odd considering what we've learned on this list. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey, and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments in it. Hauntingly bare compared to what else we've seen on this list, but it gets a little better. We're not done yet. Finally, number one, Queen Nefertiti's Hidden Chamber. When researchers are 90% sure about something, that's a pretty good sign. You only say you're 90% sure of something when you know for sure, for sure. You leave 10% in case anything else goes wrong out of your control, right? 90%, that's confident, we got this. So when Egyptian authorities said they're 90% sure there's a hidden chamber in King Tut's tomb, well, we got a little jazzed, a little, got some jazz hands going on. Not gold, jazz hands. Back in 2015, a paper was published on the burial of Queen Nefertiti. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves argued that while conducting scans on the ancient site, Reeves found what resembled traces of doors beneath the plaster. Now, it's been considered previously by archaeologists that King Tut's mask, having ear piercings and all, suggests that at that time, that tomb and that death mask was actually meant for Queen Nefertiti, not King Tut. But because King Tut died suddenly when he was 19, plans had to quickly change. 90% sure is good enough for me. What do you guys think? Comment down below all your thoughts. Kicking off the list at number 10, the first zoo. Long before the pyramids were even built, Egyptians were getting quite creative. They were the first to see a petting zoo. How brave is that, if anything? Yeah, let's just start touching animals and then see what happens. Let's do it. 6,000 years ago, Hierakonopolis was the capital of Upper Egypt during the pre-dynastic period. It was beautiful. It was sitting alongside the Nile River, which was even more beautiful back then, you can't even imagine. And in those days, perhaps the best way to flaunt your wealth was by getting an exotic pet. Yeah, the old Mike Tyson trick. There were excavations done back in the late 19th century by English archeologists James Quibble and Frederick Green, and they discovered that this town was once thriving with over 10,000 residents. It's a lot of people. It's a lot more people than we ever thought. That alone is amazing. That's a historical feat. But when further studies were performed, they also found the remains of an elephant surrounded in cosmetics, surrounded in ivory bracelets and amethyst beads, the whole glorious, you name it. A worshiped elephant. That's odd. Then they found the remains of cats and dogs, also worshipped. The dogs, slightly more worshipped. Common pets, some crocodiles. Again, brave owners there. There's also hippos, leopards, wild ox. It was a wild time. They were carefully buried, but the broken bones suggested a cruel history sometimes. But most of the times, they were pets. Not as bad as we thought there. I'm like, oh, ancient pets? No, they're good. A lot of ivory. Number nine. King Tut's passing. Perhaps one of the greatest mysteries is of course the history of the young King Tut. Younger than we remember, honestly. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC. Yeah, what were you doing at age nine? I was mini golfing, maybe, I don't even know. During his time ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia at this point were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh passed away at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was ever seen again. That's when Howard Carter, of course, discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful, you know, historically, because when Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin, but in doing so, they got a little bit too excited, they didn't really know what they were doing back 
then, so they damaged him. Yeah, they damaged an ancient king. How brutal is that? So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age, especially for a king. We have some ideas though, it's not entirely hopeless at this point. It was believed King Tut, after some 3D scans were done, had a broken leg. So he may have fallen off a chariot or something. So if King Tut passed at an early age out of nowhere, hopefully this was the reason why or else there's another mystery afoot. Number eight, the first peace treaty. The first peace treaty in history ever was back in 1259 BC. Now at this point, ancient Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over what's now modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting for centuries. And finally, come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. Of course, there was tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? For the first time ever, a peace treaty was agreed upon. Ramses II and King Hadassuli III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if perhaps a third party decided to get involved. They saw their resources, they saw that they were lacking on both sides, so like, hey, we have no we have no shot really. Let's just team up. A copy of the treaty can now be found in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official. If you don't believe me, every 90s kid watching right now is like, oh, really? Amen. That's a fact. That's a true fact right there. Those holographic covers. What a trip. Number seven, board games. I love board games a lot, even Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, huh, talk about patience, my friends. They also loved board games. They created them. They got that board, kind of time. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen and Sinet, and 20 Squares, those are the classics. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC. Now the goal was to reach the center of the spiral, so we think we're trying to piece it together. The board was a coiled snake almost, pretty creative. Senate was the most popular game of all time. Queen and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now of course the rules are still unknown, still heavily debated, just like Monopoly even today. But we have some ideas how Egyptians played it. Three of 10 squares, the last five are decorated, so it's assumed, like everything else in ancient Egypt, that this was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these boards. I'm gonna be buried with a GameCube or something like that. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so that's how you know it's a good one. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. God, I'd be so anxious. I'd be so nerve wracking. I wouldn't even play checkers with a pharaoh. That'd be too scary. I'm bad at checkers and chess. I don't know how to play chess. I'm lying to you guys. I've never played chess. I don't know how to. Number six, Akhenaten Moon. This queen was ruling during the 18th dynasty of Egypt. The pharaoh Akhenaten, well, this was his daughter. She followed in her father's footsteps and was a great ruler, but she was also the wife and half-brother of one King Tut. A pretty conflicted spot to be in, historically. Her and King Tut had the same father, but their mothers were different. Now, after Tut's death, however, it's believed this queen may have married the pharaoh Ai shortly after, and perhaps she's buried near him right now in the Valley of the Kings. Back in 2010, DNA testing was being done in tomb KB21, and there were two 18th dynasty queens that were recovered from that tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Could it be, perhaps? There wasn't enough data that was found from the mummy, but they do know that the DNA is somewhat of an 18th dynasty royal bloodline, so we're definitely close. In another tomb, tomb KB63, numerous coffins were found, and one had an imprint of a woman on it, along with jewelry, women's clothing at the time, but the biggest clue really at this point was pottery fragments. Of course, it's always in the pottery. We've all played Ogre enough time, always check the pots. The name Paten was on one of these pottery fragments. That's another clue. The only person to ever use his name historically was the long lost queen, of Akhenaten. So now we're getting real close, dangerously close. But it feels weird to watch so many tombs be opened up at this point. Like, yeah, we're getting close to finding out things historically, but can we just leave these leading ladies alone? I feel like they dealt with enough men in their lifetime. Now we're just like, Boof. we're like, hey, is that her? Nope, we're good. It's like, eh. Let them rest. They have fake doors. They don't want us coming in. They were good and then they were great and then they were absolute trash. The Amenhotep. All right, so on the top of the bucket, we got Amun One. He's the great great granddaddy. He effectively extended Egypt's boundaries into Nubia. Next is great granddaddy Amun the Second, who was an army leader with famous archery and battle skills. Supposedly, he was able to shoot arrows straight through a thick of copper plates. His athletic ability was incredible and he was known to have rowed a ship faster than 200 of Egypt's strongest navy men. Next is Granddaddy Amun III, who built himself endless monuments and temples. Perhaps his most famous construction was the Temple of Luxor in Thebes. This temple has become one of the grandest and most famous temples in Egypt. His diplomatic relations allowed art and culture to flourish, and his building projects are legendary. And then there's Disastrous Daddy Akhenaten, or Amun IV. This nutcase was obsessed with the sun god Atum, and changed his name, appearance, politics, lifestyle, anything he could to feel close 
closer to his lord. This pharaoh was so hated that Egyptians themselves wiped his name from their history. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Armania and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean the horizon of Aten and then ordered a new capital city be built there, moving an estimated 20,000 people over to make it. When he enforced monotheism, Og failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the nation's socio-economic cultural hubs, who was the god priest that oversaw all of their industries. So without them, those pillars of the communities were just gone. And stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest reception. And then we've got the bottom of the bucket, we have our boy Tukmahad, aka King Tut, who by his third year changed his name to Tukmahad and issued decree restoring temples, images, personnel, and privileges of the old gods to undo what his dad had done. He also began the protracted process of restoring the sacred shrines of Amun, which had been severely damaged during his father's rule. No prescription or persecution of Aten though, Akmahan's god, was undertaken, and royal vineyards and regiments of the army were still named after Aten. Tukmahad unexpectedly died in his 19th year, whatever the case, he died without designating an heir. This is another four part family tree. First, great granddaddy Snerfu founds the fourth dynasty and marries the daughter of the last pharaoh of the third empire, thus helped to solidify his possession as the pharaoh of the new dynasty, as well as secure Khufu's place in the line of succession. Meanwhile, his son, who becomes granddaddy Khufu, pops out the great pyramid of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the world. Apparently, we were so impressed by this that we forgot to write anything else about him or why he did this because we know very little about Khufu. We know he reigned 23 years between 2500 and 2566 and we know he married his sister. Shocker. Khufu traded for highly rare items, prizing both construction materials and precious materials like copper and turquoise, and so he developed the mining industry in Egypt. Limestone and granite were also quarried in vast amounts for rather large building projects that he was working on. Built over a period of 27 years, the Great Pyramid is undoubtedly Khufu's greatest legacy. Khufu's children include nine sons and six daughters, including Defreya and Khafri, who would both become pharaohs following his death. When in power, his son Defreya moved eight kilometers north of Giza and established a new necropolis on a higher leveled ground. Defreya's pyramid was quarried for its stone and as such there's very little of it left standing today. Meanwhile the underson Khafri succeeded the short lived Radifi and married his sister and two other queens who were probably his sisters. Best known for his pyramid, one of the three great pyramids of Giza and also best known for the sphinx which bears his likeness on its face. And who else but the Ramses clan? The Ramses the first gets the throne in a super uneventful way. He was friend and confidant to the former pharaoh who didn't have a single heir. Then Ramses spent all of his free time marrying all four of his daughters. Meanwhile, his son, Seti I, led a great army of 60,000 men and fought in many battles north of Palestine and Syria. King Ramses II, son of Seti I, was able to finish his father's work by beating the Hittite army in battle of Kadesh and creating the first documented peace treaty in history. Ramses II went on to declare himself a god and rule Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is insane in an era where life expectancy was 30. But before getting to that ripe old age, Ramses spent any free time he had chasing anything with two feet and a heartbeat, enough to sire 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his own sons, leaving no heir. They're back again, the Ptolemies. People loved learning about this batch of literal bastards in the recent top 10 powerful families in history you didn't want to mess with video. Apparently y'all like when I'm doing tongue twisters. For those who don't know why this family could be a tongue twister, an important note is that they always recycled the family names, men always named Platonomy, and women always named Cleopatra or Berenice. They also happen to really, really, really take the old Egyptian ideology of royals only being with other royals a little too seriously. What's created is a massive family tree, one full of manipulation, contempt, scandal, and brash killings. While the Platonomies started off strong, building the Library of Alexandria, compiled a star catalog and the earliest surviving table of trigonomic function, and establishing mathematically that an object is and its mirror image must make an equal angles to be a mirror. After the fourth, however, the family became like the Kardashians, talentless and messy. They took up everybody's time, but nobody stopped the free entertainment. So like last time, let me limber up and I'll run us through some of the notorious BS. Platonomy 4 killed his mother, who had killed her husband, who was having a love affair with her mother, and then married his sister Aaron So 3, who was then later killed 
after Platonomy 4 died. Platonomy 12 annoyed his children so much, particularly his daughter Berenice 4, that they rebelled against him and drove him from Egypt. Berenice 4 ruled briefly. She probably had her sister killed. She certainly had her husband strangled, who Keholer, wasn't a family member. She was beheaded on the orders of her father. Platonomy 12. Platonomy 14 was the younger brother of Cleopatra 7, that's the Mark Antony one, and possibly poisoned by that same sister. Platonomy 7 was then killed by his uncle, the next Platonomy 8, at a wedding feast, or he may have been killed by his own father, Platonomy 4. Scholars disagree. It's so messy, my mouth's so dry. Let's go on to the next one. Our favorite bearded lady was part of this family. It's the Thutmose line. Granddaddy Thutmos the first became king after Amenthal died without an heir. Probably one of the previous monarch's generals, he came to the throne around age 40 and is thought to have ruled for a little over 10 years. Historians have generally described Thutmose II as a frail and ineffectual, just the sort of person that a purposely shrewish hapshaput could push around. Public monuments, however, depict a dutiful hapshaput standing appropriately next to her husband. Wife to Tut II, Hapshaput failed in the more important duty of producing a son. So when Thut II died young in 1497, yet again, the throne went to a harem child. Duly named Thutmose III, this child was destined to become one of the great warrior kings of Egypt. But at the time of his father's death, he was too young to take the rule. As widow, Hat became regent leader until Thut came of age. Within a few years, however, she proclaimed herself pharaoh, a vile upsurge. And the seven years past that point, she'd taken up cross-dressing imagery. Once depicted as slim and graceful queen, is now full-blown, flail and crook-wielding king with the broad, bare chest of a man and the ferric false beard, but also still long, flowing hair and feminine features. Upon Hat's death in 1458, her stepson, then likely in his early 20s, finally ascended to the throne. Thutmose III was a skilled warrior who brought Egypt's empire to the zenith of its power by conquering all of Syria and crossing the Euphrates. The spoils from his many wars made Thutmose III the richest man in the world. His military accomplishments are recorded on the numerous monuments he built himself. In at number 10 is jewelry making. Egyptians saw deep spiritual significance in their jewelry, but also had a love of aesthetics. And those two things combined to create some of the most unique and lavish jewelry found in history. Worn to ward off spirits, protect health, bring good luck, and more, there were even certain colors and designs that were associated to certain gods and powers. And so Egyptian jewelers followed very strict rules regarding the mystical aspects of their jewelry creations. While a woman usually would not be a metal worker in Egyptian society, it was very common for her to be making jewelry. The tools were smaller and the process required less heat and thus less danger for her. Metal work techniques included precious metal sheets that were cut and shaped, notched together. Wire work was accomplished through strip twisting. Pieces could be held together with this wire stripping system or crimping techniques. These strips were also how link chains were accomplished as well as the securing of beads or the backs of earrings. And for jewelry designed exclusively for burial, the metal was often quite thin, as the jewelry of the deceased was not subjected to the wares of everyday life. Precious stones, ivory, real flowers, and shells were all common ornaments, as was name engravements, but it was more common with royalty. Jewelry makers were women of high status due to these contributions and the revelry jewelry held in ancient Egypt. For number nine, it's house vendors. Recognized as an ancient heritage profession, and was at its most popular during time periods of ancient Egypt where women were restricted from going out when married. These vendors would roam neighborhoods with buckets and baskets of product for sale. Clothing, perfume, fabric, snacks. Now, what was unusual is that the vendor was more often women than men. Walking the streets alone, making these sales because many married women weren't allowed to go out walking the streets alone to make sales. You see the irony. Anyways, this profession found great popularity in single women, and many also were called upon to act as nurses in homes of the wealthy when needed. The career is named Al Dalala, but the idea itself has long been extinct with the freedom for Egyptian women to roam commercial districts. Number eight is being a dancer. Ancient Egyptians loved their music and dance. They were celebratory, but also ritualistic at times. Farmers would dance to thank the gods for a good harvest. Dance groups would perform at banquets. People would go dance around the Nile in the lush season. The list goes on. Many Many men and women chose dance as a career, and it was a highly respected one. Dancing was considered an acceptable and normal part of life and even important to it. Most festivals were incomplete without it. In fact, dancing was such a revered career that dancers could start as a peasant and become a high status person from it. 
just like being a celebrity in the way that people would go to see them perform. Women at the time were even more revered for their grace, elegance, and acrobatics. This career had seven types of dance, gymnastic, movement, pair dancing, imitative dance, which was like acting like animals, group dances, like a historic cheerleading squad, dramatic dance was female exclusive and rested in illustration, war dances, grotesque dance, and then religious chant dances at temples, and lyrical dance, which was usually a depiction of lovers. Wig makers are number seven. Egyptians loved wigs for a reason that surprises many. It helped keep their heads cool. I mean, it also helped with hygiene and scalp pests and looking pretty, but the heat thing is what really gets folks. Many Egyptians had shaved or cropped hair, and the mesh-like base of a wig versus a headscarf allowed the body heat to still escape. And as said, wigs were also a great shield from lice or other invasive bugs. The hair used in the construction of wigs and hair extensions was always human and was either an individual's own hair or had been traded or bought. Hair itself was a valuable commodity ranked alongside gold and incense in a count list from the town of Cahoon, which puts emphasis on the popularity of wigs. When hair was collected for a wig, it was thoroughly combed and then sorted into lengths individually. The Egyptians invented a variety of hairdressing tools and the wig makers would take the time to braid or coil the hair depending on the wig style, coating each with warm beeswax and resin fixative so that it would harden when cool. The job itself isn't unusual, more so the booming industry it had. Wigs weren't worn to this extent anywhere else at the time, and while yes, they were functional against the sun, they were more so aesthetic than anything. Individual braid and extensions could also be attached to someone's scalp for aesthetics, the way that box braids, twists, faux locks, and many other ethnic hairstyles are accomplished today. Wigs were made in a type of factory setting. Archaeologists have uncovered the remain of wig factories, wig boxes have been found in tombs, and multiple mummies have been found with wigs or braided in extensions. Number six, we meet our ladies of the night. Unlike most ancient and even modern civilizations, selling intercourse is illegal or was highly governed. In ancient Egypt, this wasn't even close to the case, but rather the opposite in a peculiar way. Women who worked in the sexual industries were considered divine and respectable, as their career was considered to please the gods. They earned high status and lived in luxury. Working freely and openly, these ladies adorned themselves with red lipstick and eye makeup that differentiated themselves from other women. They were also tattooed, diamond shaped dots along the thighs and on the fingers or images of the god Bess. When the French invaded, they brought STIs and they spread rapidly through the brothels and this prompted the French authorities to introduce a law forbidding French troops from entering the brothels or having these ladies in their rooms. Guess those ladies were hard to resist because anyone who offended the law received death penalty. But don't worry son, as long as you live, dad's gonna pick your career. Young men didn't get jack bleep in the way of choosing what they wanted from the day their little man got snipped. They were harassed about marriage by their mom incessantly and dad's always yelling at them for not holding the Dandera flashlight in the right spot so he could see more properly. This is because once a man is viable for marriage, he needs to be prepared to support his partner. A father's rule became about teaching his son's living skill. Herodotus and Diodorus often refer to a hereditary calling in ancient Egypt. Not a system of rigid inheritance of a career, but an endeavor to pass on the father's function to his children. If dad teaches you glass blowing primarily, but also woodwork and butchering, then you're gonna start as a glass blower and use your time outside of it to learn and integrate into the trade you prefer more. Maybe it was butchering or woodwork, but maybe it was something different altogether. A son was commonly referred to as the staff of his father's old age. By mastering his father's trade before one of his own, at ensured as dad ages, son can take care of the family business if it's more lucrative and supports his father better that way. By the way, for this reason, adoption was huge in Egypt. And once you're an adult with a family to support, you'll learn how currency was nightmarish. Up until the time of the Persian invasion in 525 BCE, the Egyptian economy operated on a barter system based on agriculture. The monetary unit of ancient Egypt was the deben, and it was approximately 90 grams of copper. Expensive items could also be priced in deben. So, like if a 75 liters of wheat cost one deben, and then a pair of sandals also cost one deben, it made perfect sense to the Egyptians that a pair of sandals could be purchased with a bag of wheat as easily as a chunk of copper. Even if the sandal maker had more than enough wheat, she would happily accept it in payment because it could be easily bartered in exchange for something else somewhere else. The most common item used to make purchases were wheat, barley, and cooking or lamp oil, but in theory almost anything would do. Beer was the most popular drink in ancient 
ancient Egypt and was frequently used as compensation. The lower class of society produced the most goods used in trade and therefore provided the means for the entire culture to thrive. Even if it did mean going to the market required bringing just as many bags of things with you as you were going to leave with. And since I mentioned beer, life in Egypt would be impossible unless you liked liquor. Wages were paid primarily in grain. Thanks weird Egyptian currency system, just what I wanted to bring home after a 10 hour labor shift. A 6 pound bag of barley, which was then used to make the two staples of the Egyptian diet bread and beer. Beer was made from barley dough, so bread making and beer making happened simultaneous. Egyptians made a variety of beers of different strengths, which was calculated according to how many standard measures of liquid was made from one hecate of barley. Thus, beer of strength 2 was stronger than beer of strength 10. These divisions were made because there was no 100% clean drinking water, so everybody of all ages drank beer all the time. And what's beer cause? Bloating, weight gain, heartburn, liver issues, and if you're predisposed to any of these things and you have to spend your life drinking beer, make sure not to jump up and down, you're probably going to combust. But don't worry, if the beer has you feeling like crap, you definitely had access to laxatives 24 7. An investigation by the UK's University of Manchester and the Egyptian Medicinal Plant Conservation Project provided findings that laxatives were an accessible and normally product by ancient Egyptians. Doctors in ancient Egypt believed the human body should be regularly flushed out to prevent disease and clean the intestines, not just in times of illness. Many Egyptians took this advice and used castor oil to force waste out of their body. Figs, bran, and dates were also used as laxatives in ancient Egypt, and one ancient remedy to relieve excess gas and indigestion was cumin, a hefty portion of goose fat, and milk, boiled together, strained, consumed. Metcalf, a scientist in the Manchester University School of Medicine, adds that the Egyptian use of bowel stimulants such as the bitter fruit coxin and castor oil remained in clinical use until about 40 years ago, so the amount of crapping would have definitely made living in ancient Egypt crappy. And naturally, what's worse than being terrified to leave? Like the people of Mesopotamia, India, China, and Greece, ancient Egyptians lived in modest homes and apartments, raised families, and enjoyed their leisure time. A significant difference, however, is between Egyptian culture and that of other lands was that the Egyptians believed their land was intimately tied to their personal salvation, so they had a deep fear of dying beyond the borders of Egypt. It was thought that the fertile dark earth of the Nile River Delta was the only area sanctified by the gods for the rebirth of the soul in the afterlife, and to be buried anywhere else would be to be condemned to non-existence. Those who served their country in arms or those who traveled for a living, saved money, and made provisions for their bodies to be returned to Egypt should they be killed. However, due to this belief, as we know Egyptians were not amongst the world's great travelers. There is no Egyptian Herodotus, Elvia Chalabi. Even in negotiations and treaties with other countries, Egyptian preference for remaining in Egypt ensured everyone had to come to them. Even within the confines of the country, people did not travel far from their places of birth, and most, except for times of war, famine, or upheaval, lived their lives and died in the same locale. It's believed that one's afterlife would be a continuation of one's presence. The yard and tree and stream you saw every day outside your window would replicate your afterlife exactly. So Egyptians were encouraged to live gratefully within their means and care for their environment and never leave. Kicking off our list at number 10, afterlife servant. Ancient Egyptians were closely connected to the afterlife, or at least they tried to be. After a loved one passed, ancient Egyptians would ensure that they have everything that they needed in the living world as well in the afterlife, right? Every valuable belonging, everything that you held dear to you your entire life, ideally that's what you want to take to the other side, right? And that also included, sadly, lifelong servants. These masters were thinking about their necessities in the afterlife and of course, being otherwise useless without their servant, they have to bring them too. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? That would probably suck for the other guy, right? Yeah, it did. It really did. Someone dies, now you gotta go too? You're like, what? Forced to be a literal ride or die. That is impossibly unfair. That's ancient Egypt for you. This tradition thankfully changed before many of these famous pharaohs that we know were put into power. So it didn't last forever, this horrible theme, this idea, but it did happen a lot. Famous pharaohs came into power and this tradition underwent a change, but eventually this practice led to the introduction of number nine. The Shabti. The Shabti were tiny carved figurines that would often be placed inside of these tombs of the pharaohs. Now you've probably seen them at some point and thought that they were just a valued belonging, which obviously they were, but their real purpose was much more grand. These beautiful little works of art were always shaped like mummies and on each and every Shabti carved into them were special instructions that determined what job they got in the afterlife. Yeah, it's like the world's oldest resume right there. Number eight, what's the buzz? Here we go, shout out to all the bees. Cleopatra was the 
last Greek ruler of Egypt, and she had some bold ideas, you could say. So we're not exactly sure of its purpose, but we have some ideas. But there's a large amount of experts that have all agreed that Cleopatra, Greek Egyptian ruler of Egypt, she was known to sometimes fill a small box with a bunch of bees and then shake that box around to disturb said bees. And voila, now we have a very weak massager. There's been some speculation as to why she created this bee box, and sure, you can use your imagination to some degree, probably, yes. This invention, this scandalous idea, we're pretty sure it was inspired during her time ruling in Egypt, because, you know, all the bees. Also, to put a box of bees anywhere near your box of bees, you know what I mean? Bravo, that's brave. If she did what all these scholars think that she did with this vibrating box of bees, then double bravo. That's brave. I don't even go near one bee flying around, let alone a box of them. No, thank you. Number seven, shaved eyebrows. <gasps> ah, close one. I thought they were gone there for a second. Look, I love animals, okay? We all grew up with cats, dogs in our family, birds. We had a chameleon at one point. That was interesting. But nobody mourned for their furry loved ones like ancient Egyptians. When the family cat died back then, not one, but every family member involved in the household, they would all shave off their eyebrows to mourn the cat's death. Cats were loved extra hard back then. Yeah, you think cats were spoiled today? When's the last time you saw your friend with their shaved eyebrows after their cat passed away? Yeah, didn't think so. God forbid, but if that fateful day shall arrive, commit, you know what I mean? Shave them off, show them your love and shave them off. Number six, stitches. While surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, common surgeries, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, one, no painkillers and antibiotics, and two, it's gonna hurt, and the list goes on and on, it's horrible. But one thing that's less invasive, but still quite extremely important back then, that was seen quite a bit during these times, was the use of stitches. Yeah, probably need some at some point, building pyramids made of stones and rocks, you're gonna cut yourself. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own stitches in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers, hair, so gross, tendons, even more gross, and even wool threads. Evidence in different mummified remains have been discovered. Yeah, imagine that, you cut your arm, you have to use someone else's tendon to stitch it up. No thanks, just leave it open, I'm all set. In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus, that came to ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described, and they all sound like a great time. One example from the text of treating a laceration reads, quote, if thou findest that wound open and it's stitching loose, thou shalt draw together for him the gash with two strips of linen. Basically says, hey, if you cut yourself, grab a shirt. Good luck, don't move too quick. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more, it's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a that's more of a home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. Eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain ad why did I do this to myself? Contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That Allison really helps. Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery! Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots, with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing said spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought. 
they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. No, no thank you, that's pretty horrible. That's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint, I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up, I'd pass out, I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne, mm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon, who knows? Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead based. Now, that sounds pretty bad. I can't lie. It does. And it likely was for some, but it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important, especially in the marshy areas around the Nile, where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. Huh, neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month, we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap for starters. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you'd passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body. And then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that stuff, turpentine, turpentines, all the time and teens, just all in there washing it out. Then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days. That's a long time. But around day 40, you would stuff it with sand. Now come day 70, finally, that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits forever, really. And then there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber. Now it's, we don't do it, it's not as fun anymore. We don't put our organs in jars. We don't stuff anyone with sand. We should, you know what? We should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it. I think it's time. Yeah. Number two, Ramses II with a vengeance. As some of you may know, Ramses II was the greatest of the rulers of the 19th dynasty and second longest reigning pharaoh ever. He lived to the age of 90, was an amazing warrior, leading the armies of Egypt by the age of 22, and has literal tons of statues of himself all over Egypt. He is also probably a lot of people's ancestors since he had 96 sons and 60 daughters, approximately. So yeah, it was kind of a big deal in 1881 when archaeologists discovered his mummy with a whole bunch of other ones in a secret chamber at Deir al-Bari. Originally, Ramses was buried in the Valley of the Kings, as he should have been. But because of the risk of grave robbings, he was moved to a secret chamber. And then, after his discovery and stay at the museum in Cairo, he was moved again in the 70s when he got a passport to travel to Paris. This guy gets around. Number nine, Rosetta Stone. You are too fine to be laying down in bed alone. I can teach you my language, Rosetta Stone. Man, we all miss the old Drake. Girl, don't tempt me. Anyway, speaking of diamonds in the rough, the Rosetta Stone, pretty, pretty shocking and important find. What is it? Well, basically, it's a large stone tablet that has the same paragraph written on it in three separate languages. Why is this so important, you may ask? Well, it's basically helped us learn everything we know about ancient Egypt, more specifically translating Egyptian to Greek and then to English, or since it was discovered by some of Napoleon's people and forces, uh, it would have been in French. To put it in modern terms, it's as if you were back in grade 11 reading Shakespeare and not understanding a single word, but then the bully in school finds the cliff notes for Romeo and Juliet and decides to do a nice thing and share them with everybody. Yep, that makes sense. Good euphemism. That's a good one. Number eight, Khufu's ship. 
When pharaohs passed on into the afterlife, they put a whole whack of stuff inside their tombs that were meant to come with them into the next plane of existence. It's why we see the mummified versions of their favorite cats and dogs, favorite foods, and tons of treasure. Unfortunately, after you're gone and buried, some opportunistic people are gonna bust down your tomb doors and steal all your stuff. I'd like to see those grave robbers steal what Khufu brought with him. In 1954, archaeologists found out that, among other things, Khufu had a 140 foot boat with his name on it, buried in pieces at the base of the Great Pyramid where he was entombed. It was almost perfectly intact, and after digging it out of the ground, they put it on display at the Solar Boat Museum, right next to where it was buried. Hopefully, that's close enough for Khufu to still use it in the afterlife. Number 7 Mummy Workshop Here's a recent discovery for you. Archaeologists in 2018 discovered a well preserved embalming workshop complete with labeled oils. Ooh. What's an embalming workshop, you ask? Well, it's the place where kings go to shed a few pounds. Ooh. By that, I mean have their organs removed to be pickled in jars for the afterlife. My favorite part of this process is removing the brain. Because, you know, you don't need that. Lots of folks walk around without those all the time. Basically, you get a long hook surgical tool and you find the good pink stuff up here through the nose. After stirring the pharaoh's memories like an Italian baker mixing bread dough, you flip the royal over and just let that all drain out till she's empty. I legitimately get queasy when talking about the stuff, that's not a joke, I, I seriously do. But you know what, I'm glad we found the place and smarter people than I understand it. All I know is that if an Egyptian embalmer asks you to lick the spoon, you say no. Don't do it. Number 6. Construction Manifest You know, a lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? You know? What stumped people about the pyramids is how they were built. So for our next discovery, how about the discovery of a port in 2013 that had a piece of papyri? Isn't that so much more exciting than a massive 138 meter tall building? Mm -hmm. The piece of papyri actually was a sort of manifesto for those massive buildings. It basically said, the limestone used in the Great Pyramid was shipped from a quarry at Tura to Giza along the Nile River. It also said that it took four days, and it talked a little bit about how long Khufu was in charge of Egypt and the guy who was in charge of building the pyramids. See, it's, it's very exciting. Number five. Queen Nefertiti's Disappearance Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BC. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes. She was only 15 years old when she married 16-year-old Akhenaten. Again, always so young and just forced this family forced fun. She worshipped the sun god Aten at the time, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital called Armana. She even created a new religion, was onto some good stuff. She ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in Egyptian history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters. Many believe this has something to do with her disappearance. After reconstructing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished. Yeah, historically, just like that, boom. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's side of the legacy. She was gone from everything, and many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather, she disguised herself and continued to rule. See, the next in line after Akhenaten's reign was Pharaoh Smenkeher. Was that really enough for Titi in disguise? I hope so. That's like some she's the man stuff right there. The reason we believe she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshaput. She ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century, so it's possible, we've seen it. And lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. Like I mentioned, she had six daughters and then she disappeared. This is, this is ancient history we're talking about. Always brutal, no matter what. Beautiful, but brutal. Number four, Cleopatra's. Sure, she may have been born in Egypt, but Cleopatra, despite what many believe, was not Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted for centuries. DNA-wise, she was barely Egyptian, but as she grew up, she was determined to learn all about Egyptian culture. And due to political structure, she started to style herself after the god Isis. She was the first Cleopatra that claimed to be Isis after the third Cleopatra. Yeah, there's way more than we think. 
was like seven. Number three, King Ramses VIII, the last son of Ramses III. He's the seventh pharaoh of the 20th dynasty. King Ramses VIII, yeah, history is confusing with these numbers sometimes. I gotta tell you, I had to type that one out a few times. I was like eight, third, carry the eight, nine, Ramses what? The lost king had the throne for a very short amount of time and historians are trying to understand why that is, what exactly happened. When the King Joffrey went wrong with King Ramses VIII here, he was the only pharaoh of the 20th dynasty whose tomb is still lost in the Valley of the Kings. So maybe it's not even there. And the thing is with his ruling being so short, the theory out there is that the tomb of KV-19 that belonged to the son of Ramses IX, many believe this tomb was originally built for Ramses VIII. But once he became king, everybody saw his true colors. They must've changed their mind at that point or changed their lane or something. They were like, eh, maybe not him, you know? There is a confirmed tomb that was never used for Ramses VIII, and that was tomb QV43. That was in the Valley of the Queens. It was made for him, but never used. Again, more mysteries. Oh, the poor souls who had to build all these tombs, and they're like, you don't need it? Okay. 57 years to make that tomb. You sure you don't need it? Okay. Number two. Baboon police. Ancient Egyptians worshipped lots of animals. We mentioned that earlier. They had zoos and elephants surrounded in ivory, all that good stuff. At one point or another, you've heard about how cats were highly respected back then, worshipped. But they also worshipped other animals as well. Sorry, cat people. Yeah, other animals are fun. Like baboons, believe it or not. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Egyptians had tattoos of baboons all over them. This was before Harambe, you know? Anyone monumental like that ever came around. The most famous piece of history that we have preserved is in the collection of the British Museum in London. There's a mummy on display and it looks a little slightly different than the rest. EA6736, fun name, but he was recovered from the Temple of Cones in Luxor, Egypt. This little man dates back to the New Kingdom period. So anywhere around 1550 BC to 10 BC. Yeah. He's quite old. Baboons would appear in art and religion all over ancient Egypt, and one of my favorite facts ever has to be that in ancient Egyptian times, pharaohs would train baboons to make arrests. Yeah, imagine stealing food and trying to run away, and then you look back and there's four baboons doing parkour behind you, telling you to stop resisting, hucking bananas at you. That's crazy. And number one, false doors. Imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb your entire life, all right? Imagine you spent years of your life dedicating everything to this research, and you finally find this door, this ancient door, you find an entrance carved into the wall. This is it. What lies beyond? You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it is a fake door, my friends. It is a false door. Yeah, you just got juked out from a guy 4,500 years ago. He's like, gotcha. <sighs> Took long. We did it. False doors in ancient Egyptian tombs are very common. Ancient Egyptians believe that these false doors were a connection to the dead. How beautiful is that? And that is how spirits were able to travel from here to there back and forth. See, most false doors can be found on the west wall because Egyptians believed the west to be the land of the dead. The west. That's the west. Which way? Which way is north? Your west, my east. How does that sound? There we go. Mr. Unpopular, Xerxes the first is number 10. Xerxes is one of two pharaohs on the list who wasn't actually Egyptian. And it ultimately puts Homi in some hot water. He ruled during the 27th dynasty whilst Egypt was a part of the Persian Empire, having the throne from 486 to 465 BC. These Persian kings were acknowledged as a pharaoh despite not being Egyptian. So Xerxes the Great, as he was known, earns a place on our list by virtue of fame. He wasn't so great to the Egyptians though. He had a disregard for their traditions and religious beliefs and allocated funds away from their temple. He also banged his niece and gave her the robe that his wife had made for him, so his wife had her sister-in-law mutilated as revenge. It was this whole big scandal. But it caused Xerxes' brother to try and upsurp him, something that Xerxes was already dealing with constantly as back at home in Babylonia, as well as in Egypt, people were trying to steal the throne away from him, causing him to pick ping pong back and forth between the two places. When he wasn't doing that, Xerxes was failing disastrously at trying to invade Greece. Eventually the embarrassment of his consistent failure to do so and the endless coup attempts on him was a bit too much and Xerxes abandoned the Egyptian throne. His failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians and by extension the film 300 hasn't been very kind. Number 9 is a famous hussy, Ramses II. This man could not keep it in his pants. Sure, 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 sure. He was was the greatest leader 
heir of the 19th dynasty and an amazing tactical mind and made Egypt prosperous, blah blah. He's the son of Seti the first and Ramesses went on to declare himself a god and the ruler of Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is an insane number for an era where the life expectancy was 30. But homeboy was not a modest pharaoh by any means. He was a lying two-faced politician who based his entire campaign on a laundry list of fabrications. The extensive architectural legacy of his reign are thought to have left the throne close to bankruptcy at the time of his death. Before getting to that ripe old age, as mentioned, Ramesses spent any free time he had Banging. Enough to sire between 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his sons. Ramses was one of the first rulers to take on the title of the Great before it was cool. All in all, he was pompous and spoiled. He left behind more statues of himself than any other person in the history of the world. He was obsessed with outshining all those who came before him, and he would tower over all those that would follow. Speaking of testament to ego, number eight is Khufu, the son of Seneferu, which I'm probably butchering, who is the first pharaoh to build pyramids. Khufu was on a one-upping mission since day one. He commissioned the Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world, which by the way we learned not too long ago is lopsided. The pyramid was originally covered in white limestone adorned with gold and since stripped away by greedy tourists over the last 4,000 plus years. He used his platform to show also establish mining and trade from what's now modern day Lebanon. Unfortunately, while he brought greatness to Egypt in ways of infrastructure and economy, socially he inspired a lot of mixed reviews due to his use of forced labor and a dismissive nature. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus was a particular critic, depicting Khufu as a vicious tyrant who used slaves to build his great pyramid. Now, many Egyptologists believe that these claims are merely defamatory, guided by the Greek viewpoint that such structures could only be built through greed and misery. If those rumors are true, then Khufu had high expectations and forced labor and no one liked him. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number seven is Cambyses, the animal hater. This this is the other Persian pharaoh on our countdown, and he too enjoyed picking on the Egyptians he ruled, but in a very indirect way. See, Cambyses enjoyed watching animals suffer. It said in his spare time he put on fights between lion cubs and puppies and made his wife watch as they t tore each other apart. In fact, nearly every story coming out of Egypt at the time of his rule told about Cambyses involved him ruining the life of one animal or another. Early on, he went to see Apis, the bull that Egyptians treated as a god. Right in front of the priests dedicated to Apis, he pulled out a dagger and just start stabbing the bull until it died, laughing at them and saying, this is a god worthy of the Egyptians. What a prick. Number six is Menkuar, the pharaoh who refused death. Even though the title of pharaoh calls them undying and the pyramids are built to take them to the afterlife, you can't blame a person for still being fearful of what happens after they close their eyes for the last time. 25th century BC pharaoh Menkuar is the poster boy for that fear. An oracle once came to him and reportedly told him he only had six years left to live. Menkuar was terrified and decided to do everything he could to avoid it, even fool the gods. His biggest plan revolved around the idea idea that as long as night never came, a new day could never start. If a new day doesn't begin, time couldn't pass, so he couldn't die, right? Right. Anyways, on this basis, for the rest of his life, he lit up all the lamps he could and convinced himself it was always daytime. He would not sleep and force countless serfs to suffer with him this way. Every night, he stayed up drinking and celebrating the success until the day he died, because the gods will always have the last laugh. Number five are the wet nurses. Wet nurses are found in all statuses and were for all statuses. One common denominator, though, is that the career kind of really sucked, pun intended. So, first, their social status was always determined by the status of who they were breastfeeding. Royal family, congrats on your special privileges, statues, private quarters, and your own tomb in the family pyramid. Also, her family would receive special perks as an extension of her. Now, royal families only wanted high status wet nurses, and while it's not clear how they were chosen, evidence suggests some kind of blood tie or faint familiar relation. Most wet nurses were from marginalized families in lower socioeconomic statuses and worked under conditions and pre-definitive wages. Wet nurse requirements for any status were intense. She'd have to have given birth at least twice, have a large but healthy body due to the belief that large bodies were more nourishing. Despite that, her breasts should be medium. Too small, not enough food. Too big, the baby's spoiled. In addition to all of these prerequisites, the wet nurse should be sweet-tempered, affectionate, and responsive to her charge. She should also abstain from intercourse because it could reduce her affection towards a child, and they also said no alcohol. A good call, knowing what we know now. Wet nurses were women exploited for the products of their bodies. As slaves, they were 
coerced for their milk as lower social status women, they were employed for their bodies to enhance their inadequate domestic status. Even her own household suffered physically and monetarily if a wet nurse defaulted or failed a contract. On the same page, surrogates are number four. This is a widespread practice in Egypt. The first story of surrogacy found in Genesis 16 of the Bible was the story of infertile Sarah having Egyptian Hagar carry her child for her and her husband Abraham. Even Egyptian pharaohs had used concubines to produce heirs. They often married their sisters or aunts and children born of these marriages were most of the time not in great or functional health and wouldn't survive. Any child born of a concubine for a pharaoh was accepted as his lawful offspring. Now, they were quite limited in their rights and they could only inherit the throne in case of the absence of another more entitled heir. Surrogates experienced similar contracts and status leveling as wet nurses. They were desired to be mothers already, have a bigger, healthier body, and naturally beauty was a desired element as well. Women of low status who made a career of surrogacy often died in childbirth or from hemorrhages due to the repetitive birthing process, but for some, it was the only career they could have. Priestress is number three, and so while it was a male dominated field, many women were employed as a priestess or a high priestess at the temples around Egypt. Mostly from upper status, many were married to the priests, which they owe their position in society. Despite this, they played roles in the temple rituals, such as servicing goddesses Hathor, Neith, and Paket, or working as dancers, musicians, singers, and acrobats in the temple. The most important priestess was known as the god's wife Amun. This woman was usually the daughter of the pharaoh or sometimes his wife. She usually held a very high position in court and performed important rituals to honor the god Amun. The priestess was in charge of managing the gods' affairs, attending to ritual dances and performances, shaking their rattles and rattling their necklaces, which were long and heavily beaded objects. By the beginning of the New Kingdom in 1550, the title Chantress of Amun was used, and it was usually the wives of the priests who gained these elevated positions as well. The concept of a woman as a priest was unheard of in many kingdoms. A high priestess and the reverence and traditions of female gods being led by women were unusual to outsiders of Egypt who oftentimes restricted most priestly activities to just men. Number two is professional mourners. Okay, so here's a weird one. Professional or paid mourning is an occupation not only found in Egypt, but in China, the Mediterranean, and Eastern Europe. This practice is literally paying a stranger to attend a funeral to lament, deliver a eulogy, help comfort the family, entertain, or lay on the ground wailing. There's some range here, depends on what kind of funeral you want to have. These paid mourners made ostentatious displays, messy hair and smudged makeup, wailing, pounding on the ground or their chest, throwing themselves about as they smear dirt and sand all over their body while they screamed. It's a full spectacle. Now, another depiction of the paid mourners in Egypt is a little more chill. Two women impersonating the goddesses Isis and Nephthys. They were believed to play a special role in someone's death. Most inscriptions of a funeral where they are present as paid mourners, they are on each side of the corpse and their bodies are fully shaved. These women also had to be childless and have a tattoo of either Isis or Nephthys name on their shoulder. Most evidence of professional mourning is seen in pyramids and tomb inscriptions, such as women holding their bodies dramatically in sorrow, braced over a casket with tears flowing. If you were a theater kid, this was definitely the type of job for you. And number one, it's the female physician. Egypt is a difficult one with historians. There's been a lot of largely ignored discoveries due to the opinions of those who found them. The evidence of women in ancient Egyptian medical fields is part of that because as it turns out, their physicians were actually primarily women. Evidence shows women in the medical profession going back into early dynastic period Egypt when Marit Ptah was the royal court's chief physician in 2700 BCE. She was the first female doctor known in world history, but there is another unnamed female physician who is listed to be the head of the Temple Neith Medical School in 3000 BCE, so maybe not. But either way, the first female doctor was in ancient Egypt. Women were highly respected throughout Egypt's history and many of their goddesses represented facets of health. Neith has been associated with the invention of birth and Hathor represents fertility. Four deities associated with healing are Heka, Sekhmet, Serket and Nephritim, which are all female. So, bizarre claims you may have heard that no women are involved in Egyptian medicine don't accord with the values of their civilization, which were incredibly equitable. By this reasoning, there were no women involved in anything of no anywhere in the world until the modern era, because history books make no mention of their contributions. But it's all up to say. Yeah.